Okay. Good morning, Professor Tootle. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm yeah, doing really well. How is uh, how is it in California now? It was very hot, but it's hopefully getting less hot, and that's cause for celebration around here. Yeah. Well, thanks. We've got 95 or 98 today, so thanks for sending it over to Colorado. Oh, it's it's un it's unbearable because it's just the same every day. You know, it's, it's just <laughs> that's true. 104 for a month just it just sucks the life out of you. Yeah. You know, interesting that today's topic, I wasn't, I didn't even have weather or climate on the, on the thing to talk about happiness and public policy. Um, but I think I, that's probably a big one. It's one of the biggest debates going on in society right now, both nationally and worldwide. And it's climate change, you know, well, and what to do thing, about it. Well, I have one thing to say about public policy that made me happy. I noticed that we had the first nuclear power plant come online uh, wow, Georgia. So I, I always score that as a victory for climate the, change. The first in first in a couple decades, you mean? Thirty years, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I, so, yeah. If Jake were here, he would look it up for us. But yeah, it's, that's true. It's been a long I didn't know time. That. We've had it has been a long time, and it yeah. is um, almost everybody except for the. I mean, there's some anti nuke folks out there, no doubt, and there's some pure environmentalists or or maybe anti demographic and anti people, you know, that think there's just too many humans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, zero growth or negative growth. Yeah. And, yeah, and there's quite a few of those. I wouldn't say it's a sig insignificant minority, but besides those folks, I think most people have kind of resigned themselves to saying nuclear really needs to be part of the mix. If we, well, if you are serious about climate change, like yeah, it has to be. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, let's not go to that yet. Um, so I'm I'm gonna. I, I don't particularly like it when facilitators, for some reason, it's a pet peeve of mine. So I, I, it's cracking me up that I'm actually using it myself. They say when there's something they don't want to talk about, we'll just put it in the parking lot. That's kind of like a, an academic thing, too. I don't know if you, if you use it or you've ever seen it. But you go, let's not talk about it. Let's put it in the parking lot. And they write a parking lot and they have the list. You should know it, me well enough to know that I reject all of those things. When they come yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I, I reject it, too, but I'm going to do it today. Um, so, um, Bart, maybe you can help me. If there's some topic that comes up that we haven't talked about and we want to put it in the parking lot to future discussion, like, I'm going to write that down, Professor, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and the reason I want to do that today is because I want to see if it's possible to have a, a conversation for a half hour or so of just purely optimistic, fun, interesting things in public policy, um, because it's the opposite of what we seem to be getting in debates or the partisan or the you know, always wanting to accuse somebody. I, and so I don't even want to go down all the examples of how it just seems like it's kind of not a fun field to be around these days. So I don't want to talk about that. We'll put that in the parking lot. But it occurred to me that there's a ton of neat stuff going on in the world. There just really is. And, and all of it is tangentially involved in, in some form of public policy one way or the other. So let me start with the basics. And you, and you may not be a subscriber to Maslow as I am. I just think it's a common sense you know, thing he created in 1954, I think it was, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. To me, it's just like, well, of course, it's kind of hard to concentrate if you're hungry, you know, or it's hard to be loving if you're thirsty, you know, I, you know, kind of a hierarchy of needs. It makes common sense to me. So I want to just kind of go through some of those, if you don't mind. Isn't it cool that most Americans, not necessarily worldwide, but I think it's getting better worldwide, um, have clean drinking water or fairly clean? Is it perfect drinking water? I assume not, but it's cleaner than it used to be a decade ago and 50 years ago and 100 years ago. Isn't it neat that most Americans have clean drinking water? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's as good as it's ever been, isn't it? I mean, yeah, maybe. It's cleaner than it needs to be. I, you know, uh, uh, essentially, you know, the, the last 30 years, the standards have gotten so strict that it's, you know, more <laughs> your water is so clean now that it's too uh it's it's really clean uh, right <laughs> and you're not just talking about needing to add minerals back in because it's too pure you know oh no i just mean that the you know the level of filtration and what they in in water it, it was fine in the 1990s and it's so much more strict now um has it gotten a lot more expensive in the last 20 well, or 30 years or more expensive in terms of, you know, building out infrastructure has gotten a lot more expensive everywhere, but, uh, 
uh, we're supposed to be focusing on the good news, right? Right, uh, but is it prohibitively expensive? I'm still talking about the good news. Is out of the tap water prohibitively expensive for the for most Americans? Oh no, uh, it's not prohibitively expensive for most Americans. It's given away for free. Uh, yeah, and that, yeah. Isn't that incredible? I, I, I just think for like cities and municipalities who had sure, to build sure. water filtration systems. That sort of yeah, but for the average citizen just trying to have a, an apartment or a condo or in a home or, or at the yeah. office, they can water is pretty plentiful. Yeah. And it's clean. And it could be even better if people would, you know, read the directions on their dishwashers. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's put that in the parking lot. So yeah. um, air, I guess that's more important. If I go back to Maslow, air is pretty remarkable. I don't know about in California, but in Colorado, I remember when I was a kid in the seventies and it was, the brown cloud was a real thing. Yeah. And yes, it is true today. There are some pretty bad days. You have a hard time seeing the Rockies from the Metro Denver area. And that's for a variety of reasons. So we can put that in the parking lot. But the bottom line is it's still cleaner in Colorado today than it was 30 years ago and it was 50 years ago and it was over 100 years ago. It's cleaner yeah. in Colorado than the last 150 years. Uh, and the same is true in California. Uh, I Isn't don't know that about, great? I wouldn't say 150 well, years. Well, 150. Yeah, we're getting older, the last 100 years. Uh, we're getting older. I think it's 150 years, isn't it? There was a lot of coal being burned in, in the front range. Uh, but not in not in California though. Ah, <laughs> most okay, of the development yeah. in California happened World War One, World War Two. So nineteen okay. you twenties, know, uh, yeah, and especially where the air quality is bad in the California is in the Valley, and most of that development happened post nineteen fifties. Okay, you know that's fair enough. Yeah. What about um, I'll, I'll, I'm with you on a hundred years. Okay. What about worldwide? Is uh, air getting better or worse worldwide? Uh, probably, well, I, I, probably worse. Yeah. And that's but, because, but, you of... know, that's also just because of India and China. And, you uh -huh. know, um, I mean, India, China and other emerging economies. That's And it's know. taking, uh, and, and that's the negative consequence of another positive, though, taking very, very poor people and moving them into the middle class. Oh, not middle class, but upper upper movement, and they want a yeah. car. You know? Starving people are become working class. Working class become middle class. Middle class, and that co and that causes pollution. Until you can it figure that have out, to, but it 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 does. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it did in the U.S. and it's doing there now, and hopefully, twenty five or fifty years from now, it will be a lot better. Well, again, a lot of that has to do with the lack of availability of nuclear power. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, of course. Yeah. Okay. We have, we should talk about nukes. Uh, that should we should talk about the history of nukes. Um, uh, how about food? It, it, are you astounded on the availability and the variety of food that we now have that we didn't have when we were kids? It is. It should be shocking to us every day that the largest public health problem among the poor is to be is obesity. Yeah. And part of that is because of some delicious foods. And I actually include McDonald's in those delicious foods. They have a lot of salt and fat and it's inexpensive. And so I'll eat a lot of it and you get heavy of it. I mean, it just there's a lot of inexpensive food that tastes well, pretty it's not good. The salt and the fat that gets you. It's the cheap. It's the cheap, high energy uh, starchy. You know, it's the fries and the soda. I like the fries, too. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's the, it's the fries and the soda that get you more uh, as much as the burger itself, you know. Yeah, the burger is probably the healthiest part of that meal. <laughs> that's a good distinction. Um, but it, but I mean the variety. I guess there's places. Um, but I'm I'm really surprised up in the mountains of Colorado. I, I, wonderful Mexican food and of course the normal bar kind of food. They're a great Chinese restaurant in this tiny little town in the mountains. I was at. Yeah. I, I mean a great Chinese restaurant. Nothing uh, is, you know, when you think about like what adds to the quality of your, your life, I think the spread of Thai food and Mexican yes. food and Indian uh -huh. food has, right. uh, uh, and you can go a lot of places in America now and get Thai, you know. That's, Isn't that's that great? Nice. And, and by the way, I remember the first time I went to England, it was 1976, I think I was 10 years old, my obviously mom and dad took me, and no disrespect to my English ancestry, but the English food back then was horrible. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's not anymore. They have the world's food in England now. I mean, you can have Thai food and Mexican yeah, food. And... It, it's true. And if you, I mean, uh, again, when I was, last time I was there, it was the late 90s. And it was a kind of, they were at a crossroads of still yeah. some horrible food and then just some amazing stuff. Uh, yeah. It, 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 and if you get Indian or something or any sort of ethnic food in England, it's going to be great. It's just awesome. How yeah. about um, how about clothing choices? Um, do you remember the big leather hiking boots? Me, I don't think you're as old as I am, so maybe you didn't have those big clogged hopper things, or the big heavy, heavy to wear hiking and camping equipment. And it's you know wool. It was nice, and then there's still a purpose for wool today and other. But it it was heavy. Well, and it was expensive. Smart wool. Right, you can get smart wool now, which is wool that gives you all the benefits, and it's but it doesn't itch. Like that's a right. Modern oh style. yeah, it is. Yeah, that's my point about this wool. And is, and and now uh, yes, there's some very expensive high tech clothing and camping equipment, no doubt. But there's also some really inexpensive clothing around, isn't there? That looks oh, yeah. nice and is functional. I mean, I'm wearing. Eleven dollars worth of, or less than twenty dollars worth of clothing right now, which <laughs> right. is really pretty amazing, especially adjusted for inflation. When you compare, like the price of, let's say, just Levi's five hundred ones, uh, when I in I, I always use high, my high school years because the rate of inflation was between today and uh, the early nineties was almost exactly a hundred percent. So you can do the math really easily, <laughs> um, mm. you know. So if, in other words, when I was making four ten an hour, then that would be the equivalent of eight twenty an hour uh, now. Uh, but when you do things like compare the price of clothing or Taco Bell, what you realize is stuff's a lot cheaper now. Um, I mean, I can still right. go to Taco Bell and get get something for a dollar thirty nine, which is pretty. Uh -huh incredible um yeah that that inexpensive meal stuff it's not as good by the way i, I occasionally go off that menu it's not as good as their more expensive <laughs> stuff <laughs> yeah, but if you just but if you just think about it like how many calories does an adult need to get by uh, uh, you can go to taco bell and spend less than five dollars and get what you need for the day uh, yeah which is you know yeah, again, that's probably true. talking about calories and getting through the day uh you can do it so um is it easy to stay and i know there's some crazy parts uh, crazy temperature parts of the country like alaska and hawaii and, and arizona and, and parts of florida like yikes hot and cold places that are in maine i think is cold occasionally but is it for the average american is um keeping warm a logical easy thing to do or is it an overwhelming burden for most people and I, and yes i realize there's poverty uh, and yeah no, no it's i mean it really is amazing I, I was just preparing for a lecture in a couple of weeks thinking back to like when theodore roosevelt was negotiating coal strikes tens of thousands of people would die <laughs> in america if uh if there was a coal strike and um now uh, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, we have backup systems for our um, um, for for our energy sources, and you know, it's 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 not going to lead to ten or hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, it uh, makes huge news because there's always problems when there is a well, sure power and outage, it, and, and there you know, it, and stuff happens. But I mean, I've got one air conditioner; it's not working right now, and. Uh, a part that's been on back order. And um, so I haven't had air conditioning in half of my house for four weeks. And it's really unpleasant when it's 106 outside. Um, I bet. Uh, but, um, but, and uh, I had to pay an electric bill because I have solar, which means I almost never have, I, I have never had an electric bill since I got solar. And all of a sudden I got a bill for $300. I was like, oh my gosh. Yikes. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was it was shocking, but yes, generally speaking, it is just amazing that you've got this you've got uh, well designed um, uh, climate control systems that are now regulated at least in California regulated to go on every new home. Uh, solar is on every new home, 
uh, and uh, um, and that means that every house that's built, uh, you know, you've got you're going to have a school, you're going to have a park, you're going to have solar, you're going to have sidewalks, you're going to have trees, uh, and that is regardless of you if you are the poorest person in California or the richest person in California, and that's that's not a bad. That's not a bad set of circumstances for home ownership, you know. Even though interest rates are a little bit high right now, I when I bought my first house, got a FHA loan, only had to put whatever it was three percent down. That's the house I still live in, so uh, mm -hmm. you know I was able uh, able to get into a house with a thirty-year fixed mortgage that, uh, and only putting three percent down. I mean, that's a that's a miracle. 401k plans, that's another miracle of public policy. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about a vehicle for everyone who wants to be, to have generational wealth. Uh, I mean, might have been one of the most consequential public policy decisions of the 1980s was the invention of the 401k, you know, um, and or 403b if you're a public employee. But that stuff is, is amazing. Um uh, and all positive public policy. So um, let's go to let's go on shelter a little bit more. Um, we are concerned that it's getting a little more expensive now, though, for some folks to be able to afford, especially first time home buyers. Uh, once you yeah, built up some equity, but. Well, I guess it's a. Uh, uh, <laughs> It's a consequence of you can't escape reality. You, I mean, we we dumped trillions of, and are, are still dumping trillions of dollars into our economy, and then being shocked when inflation is the result. Um, mm -hmm. And it means that if you're going to dump that much money into uh, into our economy, um, you got to slow it somehow. Um, Right. And so that's a, a parking lot Vehicle issue. Rates. But on shelter itself, it's a worthy public policy goal to have people own a little piece of the earth. Right. And, and with some shelter on it. I mean, that's a worthy thing to encourage in a society or, well, or no, it's none of our be business. Careful how you say encourage, because a lot of bad public policy results from encouragement. I think. Uh, how about just the result? If more people own a shelter on their own property in a society, that's a good thing. Yes. Yes. Cool. I mean, that would be my goal is, you know, that, yes, I, I understand the. Yeah. The, just the be careful that you don't, you know, this is a, the, one of the biggest problems in public policy uh, across the board is confusing the metric with, um, with the result. Uh, and it, the, uh, a bunch of people owning their own homes should be the result of many things. But when you try to create public policies in order to make that happen, that's when you mm -hmm. get into trouble. That's and that's a legitimate there. debate between political, par political parties and political philosophies and how to best get to that result, right? I mean, that's something that you could put on your platform and run for and attack the other person and you know, but most people would agree that the result is is pretty noble, right? If, if yes, but I mean, I I would say I don't I don't know of anybody who has. There are no candidates or parties discussing that now. But well, that's kind of my point by wanting to have a show on being optimistic and happy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's so many cool things we went through. Everyone, oh, we well, uh, Maslow, I guess, had two that we haven't talked about, and that's sleep and sex. If you don't get those, then that causes other problems as well. And but I don't know what a history professor would add to either of those. Is there any historical precedent on sleeper sex that you want to bring up? Any are we getting better or worse on either of those? Uh, yes. In terms of public policy and sleep, I you know I think that things like um, uh, prop protection of property rights and noise ordinances. That's the next. That's the next hierarchy of need. Safety is yeah, the next. Yeah, but those thing. those yeah. enable or, or make it possible for people to have you know quiet sleep, sleep and and yeah. and live in their homes unmolested by others. You know, that's right. Good thing. Right. Well, that's the next hierarchy. He's just talking about pure sleep. If you don't get sleep, then a lot of things yeah. don't matter. 
Um, so, and then sex, no historical thing to add on that. Lots of public policy stuff about sex, but yeah. that's not your uh, expertise or I mean, area of the concentration, is it? It does seem like for whatever reason, uh, something that's happening either in society or in public policy is leading to less, uh, less sex, less romantic attachment, um, fewer intimate relationships. I just don't know what that is. Um, you know, some future historian maybe will look back on this time and be able to figure out what it is that we're doing. But did you hear uh, that show on Sarah Isker and I think it was David French or did you hear them talk about that? No, but yeah, she made a passionate plea towards going back to her high school years. <laughs> that, that this is a severe thing and we should be worried that kids aren't having as much sex. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. I think I remember this conversation yeah, I mean, a little bit. It's just yeah, a funny... it, it is strange. But but um, because on one hand, um, obviously, we don't want teenage pregnancies and the, right. and the right. problems that come along with that. But what we do want is people engaged in healthy relationships and that would include romantic attachments as well yeah, and if they don't if they're just playing video games on on them by themselves and that could be, lead to some weird things in the society yeah yeah okay so we've covered a ton of stuff is there any reason for well i don't want to mostly a parking lot question or a rhetorical question all those issues air water uh, i guess we could go climate change now you know people are worried about um, the shelters aren't going to be there or it's going to be too hot. So we're going to have to do some more air conditioning or we're going to have to mandate, as you alluded to, uh, more insulation in homes because they're uninhabitable or will be in the future, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any other basic physiological needs that we should be, um, that we missed or just because Maslow. You know, one thing that I don't think we're right. giving credit for is um, how good our landfills are now. Ah. Yeah, like Love our, that. Uh, our landfills and our dumps are really extraordinarily good. I mean, I, I marvel now that something that it, when I was a kid was something that was mismanaged, dirty, bad for the environment. Now we're so good at, you know, planning them, sealing them, making them good. And as long as you don't put them someplace where you have a lot of earthquakes, you can actually use them to create um, methane. Well, not just that, but like, or also uh, future environmental green spaces, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, build houses, make hills, you know, I, it, it, it really is um, one of those things that it, it, it happened in slow motion. But if you, if you blink and realize how much landfills have changed in 50 years, uh, that's something that our culture can be proud of. Uh, yeah. The, um, uh, on that point, my um, uh, parents' home that I just sold um, after they're both now deceased, uh, built in 1959, every single one of them had a little sidewalk built out to their incinerator. And it's a little bit of a four foot by four foot thing. And people burned their trash. I remember it as a kid. Yeah. The smell of burning plastic trash kind of esque yeah, smells just, all throughout the neighborhood. Toxic, toxins into the air, right? Yeah. And now the the neighbor, the dump that we have uh, named after the local park guy that managed the park district for 30 years, it has soccer fields on it on artificial grass. Yeah, there's a whole dump that my diapers are probably still in or the, is the is playing fields. Um, yeah. And and they're safe and clean and they don't contaminate the water that runs through our streams. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how come we're not. Um, we can skip the next four of, of um, Maslow's because really there's safety and that's talking about, you know, whether you have somebody to respond, do you, are, do you feel good in your school, in your home, health related things, um, car safety um, and home safety are going to burn up just or, you know, or crash and die in somewhere. Uh, then it goes into the love and personal connections and trust and acceptance and then to self-esteem accomplishment. And then finally, self-actualization which is you know are you having personal growth and do you feel like you're making a contribution to the world and are you having uh, peak experiences <laughs> you know and so i think it's I, it's all kind of nice but, but historically has there ever been an opportun a place in the world where in colorado or california and I, we can put some we have friends all over the place i assume south carolina is just like this and illinois i bet is close um is there a better time to be a, a citizen right now 
in in California or here? Was it 10 years ago was better or 50 years ago better or 200 years ago better um, than in America right now with the ability to be happy? And I know our friend Arthur Brooks talks a lot about this, and I'm not necessarily going in that way, but do we have all the tools in public policy um, that most of us should be happy most of the time? And yes, we can all get bent out of shape at each other um, over all sorts of things. But is there a better time than right now? Would you want to go back 10 years or 20 years or 40 years? Um, we are in a happiness Def, uh, you know, divot. I don't know what you want to call it, a, a depression right now. Um, and why? So I guess in, in that sense, you probably would want to go back. Um, well, the to, 80s were great. Well, they weren't great, but they were certainly. Um, I'm thinking music, on but average, maybe. Were happier. And the same would be true of the 90s and the, even the 2000s, even with the Gulf War and everything. So. Um, the I mean, uh, the sort of depression era started sometime during the Obama administration, um, you know, maybe a second term, uh, and really, um, accelerated. And some of it was, I mean, the those, uh, the so Jonathan Haidt would say that it's, um, directly attributable to the uh the like button being installed uh <laughs> in social media uh did uh, we and, need that dopamine push or something and nothing else yeah, matters if we're not it, getting it, that i don't know if i'm willing to you know blame it that much but um but um it, it certainly coincided with many other things i, I think that it because I also think that there's been a long uh, decline in trust in institutions. Um, I, I was thinking about this um, actually because Facebook just posted, just published this, um, or I shouldn't say Facebook, but Meta published this report about foreign influence on, on social media and how foreign governments and uh, in you know China and Russia for, for the most part, but but not just China and Russia, Iran and you know, will uh, spend money and effectively get messages out there that um, make us mad at each other. Yeah, to make Americans hate each other, <laughs> and it's working pretty well. Um, and, Even when we know that that's not new news, that's I mean that's like five no, year old news. It's not necessarily new, but where I was taking this was somewhere different, which is I was thinking about what if Mark Zuckerberg were, were actually 100% evil? <laughs> you know, in other words, I, I, know, I don't see some of these CEOs like Tim Cook at Apple. They are ruthlessly self-interested, but they're not 100% evil because they're all still capable of being shamed. You know, it means that they have some sort of moral core that you can appeal to. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, that alone means that um, that we might not like where that moral core ends up. And it doesn't mean that, that we should listen to everything they say. Same with Elon Musk, by the way, I, you know, because some people will worship at his altar. But uh, it's not so much that... Um, uh, that they're good because they're all, as I say, ruthlessly self-interested, but they do have a, a discernible value system that you can appeal to. And because of that, um, good things can result. And I think one of the more positive things is, is an unintended consequence of Elon Musk buying Twitter. One of the things, and, um, and I was thinking about this, how much um, it, Elon, Elon Musk, quote unquote, ruining Twitter. Right. Uh, one of the things that's happening as a result of Elon Musk buying Twitter and ruining it for the people who who used it was we and I I just noticed this we haven't seen any cancellations in Twitter mobs and, and all because all the people who were kind of the self appointed cancelers and Twitter mob people. Um, were all, or they all said, I, you know, they all left Twitter. 
but but that but that has had this positive effect that we no longer see the ability to single out uh, a, a particular person and get them fired, <laughs> you know, because a, a, a university or a corporation or whatever. Um, uh, Do you not remember the Bud Light thing? Come on. Yeah, professor. but again, that would, but I don't, th but that, that was, uh, 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 it doesn't mean that you can't still get the word out there. But, the, but that didn't uh, um, th that didn't get anybody fired, did it? I, I oh mean, yeah, oh yeah. I, I they, mean, the, they now the head of uh, the head of marketing of Budweiser and the CEO of Budweiser, a uh, Bud Light, fired. I think. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I guess I'd be interested in seeing the timeline on when that went down and when Elon Musk actually took over Twitter, because. Okay. It, 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 After, uh, yeah, but I, I don't. I, I understand your point because, yeah, I, I just I, I wonder if it wasn't right, you know, right before it it actually went down. So uh, this is a show on happiness and positiveness. Um, you're saying that social media and the ability for us to collect our own band of tribes electronically um, is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh. Um, it is, uh, let's see, I guess on balance, it's probably a bad thing. Um, no, it's a good thing, professor. You know, like if I go back to the seventies and if I wanted to have my word out and whether it was a silly thing I made because I'm a craftsman or whether it's a message politically I wanted to put out, there is no way one John Brackney in 1976 or 86 could have 96 could have put out that message to the world. And now anyone has the ability to actually put this silly video out, whether it's a dance move or a new pie or a new political thought. And if it's common, then it won't get picked up. But if it's a little bit of useful marketing, yeah, you can tell the whole world about it. Uh, sure, if I'm trying to spread it. That's dance. a positive. But, but, um, but the ability to gather mobs more effectively is not a net positive for society. <laughs> well, that's the democracy. And Republican certainly thing. our but founders okay. would have recognized okay. that this <laughs> is actually point. where the danger comes from yeah. in society. Yeah, it's yeah that's a good point. The, the in public policy. Yes. The unpopular minority. And right. uh, it, pouring it, gasoline it, it, on that fire is not good. Yeah. Did you say a dance move would be fine or a new pie? Yeah, or exactly. something? yeah fine. You're, you're right. It's easier to spread a dance move. It's easier to spread a recipe, but it's also yeah. much easier to gather a mob. Uh, yeah. And that's it. And so as far as public policy goes, that's a, a net negative, not a positive. Okay. Uh, let's hold that to a parking lot then. Um, what other issues did not get included in all those things we've talked about, like music or the ability to travel? or the ability to congregate, which we did allude to just then. But the things that make a citizenship possible, is there other public policy things that are now worse? Um, I'm looking for the better today, but if necessary, we write it down of something that we should be talking more about. And we've talked about it, uh, violence and racism, and we've done lots of shows on the problems of society, um, but we've done very few shows on well, we always try to have a little fun and always talk about, you know, what's improving and what's not. But there's got to be, is it, is it possible to be on a platform in public policy of things are good and yes, we can make it better, but things are pretty darn good, you all. Let's keep it. Is that possible or no? Do we need to just point about inflation's bad and climate change is bad and guns are bad and there's still racist problems and, and with the whole litany of everything wrong? What do we want? If we're both managing campaigns and we're not right now, but if we were, what what's our platform, Professor? At what level of government am I running? Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, because um, because to me, the the most effective campaigning that isn't being done is um, it, it's not it, it, because it's so easy to nationalize every issue and excite people about. Uh, national issues that tends to be where everybody campaigns now right. and i think that um uh you would have 
much better luck. And one of my friends who's a um, former student who's now on my city council, I think one of the most effective things that he did was, was he just went around door to door to everybody in his district and he talked to him and listened to him. And then he said, Oh, you know, your neighbor says this is a problem. And is this a problem? And then, you know, he, he actually has a pretty good idea of what people really want and what's actually bothering them. And, and, and thus when it starts, and you know, he's not Thomas Jefferson or anything, but like, this is what local government is supposed to do because it, it, what you'll find is that once you get past the bumper sticker with somebody, there are things that they want their government to be doing and or doing better. Uh, and um, and if you and if you build kind of from the ground up on those kinds of an issue, uh, you can still be successful. But the the downside is, somebody can always come along and with a bumper sticker, a slogan and a national issue and just drown you out <laughs> almost immediately. You can only do that until the mob shows up, you know? Um, but uh, isn't there, I guess that gets down to the point of, of why I wanted to do this conversation. Don't you think most people, and I know we always like to complain and, and it's a mean comedy or snarky this or a, a jab at that. I, I get it. I'm, I'm human and I know most humans and we all have a little bit of element of, you know, laughing at somebody down. I get it. But don't you think that most of us really would rather be inspired and, and happy and, and making a difference in the world and feeling good about your job and your family and, and doing something? And, and do we need to really be drowned out by the mob or is there just not good leadership on the other side? So what we need to recognize is that the mob is not really a mob. I mean, this is, this is the things that people get scared of, over. And, and the reason the mob looks like a mob is because you can concentrate. You can get so many people to show up and give mo a small amount of money that, 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 that it can overwhelm something that's truly grassroots. But those people are not actually the majority. They're not even close to the majority. You, you know? oh, you're talking. Talking almost any conceivable issue on the across the uh, spectrum. Uh, yeah, I'm not talking just, about any particular issue. Yeah, this. but and most people, because of the noise and rancor of social media and public public life, have just completely tuned out. That's the other thing to remember is that when we talk about this stuff, you're all you're already talking about the tiniest minority of people. Like 40% of Americans can't read above a fifth grade level. So let's just take 40% of America right off the table. And then how many Americans are active, you know, social media users? That number will look pretty big in its raw number, but then would start doing what that what that translates into in terms of uh, voters and and then you look at the kind of social media engagement that they're with what they're actually doing is they're looking at pictures of their grandkids. Now that's what makes it easy for the for somebody to you know with a conspiracy theory or some foreign government to come in and say, oh you know let's start talking about pedophiles and Jeffrey Epstein and you know uh, stuff like that like weird conspiracy theories that you know are it's never been easier. It, it, uh, to uh, peddle a conspir conspiracy theory. But at the same time, most people don't let that stuff absorb their lives because most of their lives is people who have friends, family, you know, that they're doing stuff. It, it's, it's the people who are kind of isolated where that social media world um, takes over. So from one of our earlier conversations going back maybe a year and a half ago, I mean, I'm going back to the founding of our country before, I mean, right around the revolutionary war. Um, you, if my memory is correct, you told me the average merchant and the average farmer, or the average person that went to their church and was kind of doing along, there were probably some people living out in the woods somewhere, but the average person that was known who was pretty engaged in their local government yeah. and, and active in politics. And they knew what was going on at the federal level. And they, it, they weren't ignorant. They right. were knowledgeable and thoughtful and engaged. And literate. And, and literate. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in terms of like, um, I mean, if you were active in a church, which any most people who lived in a town were active in a church, um, you would have a literacy level that would be higher than, say, a college graduate today. Okay, so we're this is a show about happiness and all the good things that are going on, but we have identified one thing that we're both concerned about for sure is that there's people that aren't engaged in the right way in, in making a productive society uh, through a variety of reasons, education and, and tuning out, um, allowing the mob to be in the minor mob to look like a major mob. There's all sorts of little problems identifying around that. Correct. Is that a sure. thing that's not as good as it used to be? Uh, I mean, I guess we've always had armed mobs. Um, True. And if I, I would, I would certainly take a Twitter mob over a, uh, you know, a clan mob, the, the clan, so, <laughs> a clan rally. Uh, right. So, um, you know, keyboard warriors don't tend to do anything. The only problem with Twitter mobs is if anybody listens to them. Uh, Okay. Um, but there's just always a big difference between actual violence and, you know, words. Perceived violence or, or threatened violence, although that's serious as well. Um, what, um, uh, what have I missed out of this? Like, do you wish I would have talked about religion more? Do you wish I would have brought up um, societal clubs, uh, you know, service organizations? Do you, what, 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 are, what are the things that make people happy and what should we be proud of? Um, well, and I'm not just talking about American citizenship. I'm talking about global humans. You know, how are we doing? Um, on balance, um, if you're just looking at, you know, the, the big metrics of human thriving, you would say we're doing pretty well. But we're not acting like it, though. We, we pretend that we're just mattered and hell and can't take it anymore. Well... I would just also say that um, pride comes before the fall, that um, that if you don't take care of your culture, that 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 kind of stuff gets wiped away in the blink of an eye. All of those good things just go away if if you don't take care of your culture. And you can go from being uh, a, a hat a happy, safe, thriving society to, um, you know, piling rocks on top of uh, each other and uh, making fire out of sticks if you don't take care of your culture. Let me see if you'll accept this analogy, and it will sound like I'm being a partisan. Um, and I get that, that somebody will listen to this and think I'm being a partisan. But let me ask you this. Um, elections. Isn't it pretty amazing that we can count up a bunch of different local, state, federal, all the different issues in Colorado? We have we can vote on initiatives, and referendum, and it's pretty darn accurate. So I just contradicted the former president and a third of the Republican Party or something that believes our elections are just fraudulent and rife with all sorts of problems. So which side do you come down, Professor? Because I'm trying to follow your school of thought. Aren't, well, don't, I would just aren't say, our I'm elections to... pretty fair? Well, I, I guess I would delineate. I'm trying to. I'll try to be fair to the Repub so the the most reasonable part of the Republican position, which is that um, if you're arguing that the rules for voting are wrong, then we can have discussion about that. But in terms of implementing the rules for voting as they are and counting the ballots that should be counted under those rules, our elections have never been more accurate. Yeah, it's pretty um, remarkable. And so however, I, mean, we don't... I, I, I do think there is something to be said for, and I'm willing to have discussions, debates, li listen to people when they say, this, this type of voting should not be allowed. Uh, this type, you know, our rules for voting should be changed in X, Y, or Z, like, uh, but, that to me, but one of the reasons why in public policy people tend to talk past one another is that a Republican will start saying, well, they shouldn't be allowed to do X, Y, or Z, which is different from saying there's actual corruption. <laughs> you know, these right. are two separate issues. 
and, and, and admittedly, Professor, we do talk um, talk back each, past each other. Even you and I probably. Um, th- to me, this seems more like a science problem rather than a public policy problem, um, because yes, there was a. a a, a, a nasty COVID-19 thing, a pandemic, worldwide pandemic that created some of these rules. And that's what some of this is about. Do, does it require a signature? And well, it, there's, there's no signature on the envelope that shall not be counted. Well, the, some people said, no, we're going to count that. And, well, dep- I would just say it depends on where you live. Because yeah. in California, the law says, no, you need to go and reconcile that vote. You need to go and find that voter, find out if they intended to vote. And if you can, then that vote still gets counted. So it's not them. That's not breaking the rules. That's implementing the rules. And so those are where those are the type of things or mail in ballots or drop boxes or automatic registration uh, when you turn 18. Uh, um, you know, all those are the things that we uh, that the political parties argue about. And they yes, sure, those I are would le- say they should be arguing about. You know? And those are legitimate public yeah, policy that, things. Yeah, yeah, that would be great if, if political parties actually argued about that. And we we're in agreement. If you don't like those rules when they're implemented, you can sue. And you can go to the court before the election, before a cast is voted. Well, no, cast. hold on. You can't. You don't get to sue because you don't like the rules that the legis. I, I mean, I guess you could sue if it was unconstitutional or something. But generally speaking, legislatures get to make the rules on voting in a state. So right, but when the Secretary of State expands the authorization yeah, you can of what like, sue under that, yeah, you can. Yeah. If, if yeah, yeah. And, and so then we throw all that into one area that, that's ripe with fraud. And then we, we're not talking to each other because we're lumping everything in there together, right? right. That, that's your point, right? Yeah. 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 But elections are fair in, in the United States from the counting of who voted. And there's not a bunch of fraudulent people out there casting fraudulent votes, correct? I mean, there's no evidence of... I guess it's conceivable. Fraud, it the, yeah. I mean, there's always yeah. fraud. There's fraud in every county. There's fraud in every election. But Sounds is it weird? Uh, yeah. Systematic? Yeah. You know, no. Yeah. And so that's one thing we should count up and just say, isn't it great that we don't have problems in, in other countries that, you know, you have a gun pointed at you and you're going to vote a certain way? Right. Yes. We're yeah. certainly nowhere close to that. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the what other positive things are we missing? Uh, so voting is a positive, not a negative, although we understand people could disagree with that. What other positive things are that I throw out music? I already threw out fo- food, but there's a, a better chance to want, listen to more music if you're a poor person in America today of a wider genre. Um, it's just incredible the amount of music you can listen to for free or very little expense. Correct. Yeah. The, uh, um Yes, uh, but absolutely. Um, YouTube, you know, you just listen to whatever you want to listen to. Yeah, it, it's amazing, right? Um, yeah. Um, now, for a different show, we can talk concert prices, which is a yeah, definite negative. That you can't do, but uh, yeah, uh, or you you probably can, but just not at a. You, you don't get to see Taylor Swift. You. Yeah, you just can't. <laughs> right. But, um, what else are we missing? Anything that comes are to mind? Are you asking for public, just things that are positive in society that uh, yeah. go underappreciated? Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, I mean, I, I guess it's like the old saying of uh, so one guy looks around and he says, sees, asks like, where are God's, God's miracles? And the other guy looks around and says, all I see around me are miracles. Um it, the ability of um, a person to live a, a life of his or her own choosing has never been greater. Uh, and um, that if, if you measure the, that as I, as I do, as like the ultimate measure of human thriving, then you'd have to say this is an extraordinary time to be alive in, in America. Um, because <laughs> this is going to sound strange. All you really face are negative incentives. You don't face actual legal barriers. So, um, it, regulations will incentivize bad behavior or counterproductive mm-hmm. behavior. But if, 
but if you if you ignore those things you can still do pretty much whatever you want um and you're talking positive and nefarious things uh yeah but i'm mostly thinking about somebody who wants to live a positive you know uh, life and make life better for themselves um but uh if you're somebody who wants to do the right thing um the law won't be the thing that prevents you from doing that it will incentivize you to to not live a good life but it won't actually prevent you um from living a good life and I, I, so th- that in and of itself is 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 pretty extraordinary so we should we, we've convinced each other in the last 45 minutes to um try to talk to our friends and colleagues in the political spheres to stop being doing what they're doing and just being uh, what was it, what's that famous thing negative nabobs of negativism you know that, yeah. it just seems like the whole is it, don't you think that most people who are in the fields are pretty bleak and down on politicians and public policy and citizenship and and we're this whole litany of things that are going on horrible and this weird group and that bad cause and it just well, seems like we're it's because you know and and really i think it comes down to um the symbolic nature of the presidency um we have a strange system you talked about we talked about monarchy briefly last week but where the president is the head of government but he's also the head of state and um we don't have a separate prime minister and a king we only have the president and i think one of the reasons why people have generally been depressed and this is going to sound crazy when i say it i can't believe i'm about to say it but i think it's because certainly for the last you know three presidents Americans look at the president and say, is that really the best we can do? I, I mean, this is our president? I, I, and I don't mean to insult President Obama by saying he wasn't a good person, but... I'm was, still, yeah, I'm surprised you include Obama in that from well, that state. I, I, he's just, he was a state senator 18 months before he was president. You know, I go, the, we, the, the idea that, that he you know, could go from being a state senator to being president of the United States, there's no way you could claim in any sort of intellectually honest way that he was the best prepared person in America for uh, holding the highest office. Agreed. And he did an okay job for the most part. I know that there's a couple of things that you can bring up that are pretty bad, no, no, but I'm not on board with saying he did an okay job. I'm really, um, yeah, really. I I I, I don't know. Uh, he was very good at rising to specific symbolic moments that we pay attention right. to, but I just don't know if we go back and look at his administration from a strictly policy and constitutional framework if we're going to go back and find that his administration was great. Fascinating. Uh, so let's put that in the parking lot since yeah. it, that could be a whole show. Uh, you know, we're talking about. Well, that's also something we kind of need to sit on for 20 or 30 years, but because that, uh, you know, that's, that's just a, a it's just a, uh, you know, a feeling that I have at this point based on, you know, because I go back and I look at the, if you look just strictly at the legislative achievements, what he did to Congress, what Congress did to him, what uh, what he did with his administration, you know, you start going through these things and you go like, this was all pretty bad. Um, hmm. And all the things that you remember as being good were moments when he said a thing <laughs> or gave a speech or something like that. All right. Uh, or how you felt when he gave a speech. But if you go back and look at his actual administration, the sort of head of government part, I don't, I don't know if if on balance we're going to say that was great. Um, Fascinating point, but again, we need to keep yes, that sorry. to the parking lot. Yeah. Um, the good news, and I would concur with uh, the last two presidents, I'm just not sure I would include Obama in that same way. Um, well, Biden I mean, and Trump, I, mean, I think you can, you can say for Obama, which is like... Um, 
at least he did the head of at least he did the head of state stuff well yeah you know okay yeah all right that's a nice positive thank you yeah. all right um ben and uh bart what did we miss today um i'm hoping that the professor added in some historical thing and he did um but it, but is there is there any value to this conversation or do you wish we just get back to being mad at each other Ben or Bart? Oh, I think there's always value in this type of conversation. Um, I would like to see us actually do more of this kind of stuff because it leaves you with a very positive attitude about what is uh, going on, at least in my mind it does, uh, versus uh, all the hate stuff we're hearing from the media, uh, let's lock them up, and all that kind of stuff. No, this is very positive. I, I'm, I'm on board with all this. I'm glad to hear that, Ben. And you missed some of the first couple minutes of our conversation about how good air and water and clothes and food, you know, some of the basic stuff that just living as a human being, that things are really actually pretty good right now. So, yeah, they are. Absolutely. Uh, you look at uh, other countries, they don't have half of what we have. Some countries don't have clean water. Um, yeah, that's kind of, to me, kind of a miracle how we've gotten to be where we are. Yeah. And we should talk about it more. So thanks for thanks for thanks for believing in that. Bart, Bart what you thinking? Um, kind of the same thing that Ben was just thinking. I think that this type of a conversation is very productive. Um, you know, because I I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, John, who's kind of like you in, in terms of being a real political insider. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was telling me, I was kind of lamenting the fact that we're in this kind of national, I don't know, convulsion of political discussion, because I think some of it is actually unnecessary when you get right down to it. And, you know, of course, we get we got on the topic of, you know, I have this view that um, that, uh, you know, Mr. Trump is no longer eligible to be president. So my friends started telling me, well, wait a minute, you know, this guy's a real Democratic Party insider. And he was saying, I want to have, a, you know, Trump on the ballot, come hell or high water. And I want him running for president from behind bars, if necessary, <laughs> because we're going to kill him. Yeah. You know, and I thought, OK, that's a great attitude. But what happens if that doesn't happen? Yeah, careful and, what you hope for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, I'm, and so I. You know, I think we're having in this country right now, for lack of a better way to put it, a failure of the elites of our society. You know, and I, of course, I guess I count myself as part of that failure. I'm not a major part of the elite, but I, I read, I study, I try to figure things out, and, you know, create opinions for myself that I can share with other people. And the... <laughs> It seems as though we've gotten to a point where no one will actually correct the people who are aspiring to be our leaders for their terms of office that they're running for when they say things that are absolutely ridiculous. And, yeah. and because no one's willing to do that, we're all sitting here staring at each other wondering why are our leaders so ridiculous well it's because we're letting them be ridiculous <laughs> yeah so that's why i was saying you know the, the the response by most people to ignore him is a completely reasonable response i mean you talk to people about like the republican debates and nobody watched it <laughs> i mean despite and, my pleadings <laughs> yeah and then after you watch it you're like i can't they didn't deserve my attention <laughs> they really didn't like I these I, I don't in my normal life I wouldn't listen to any of those people about anything like if if I was in a conversation with with one of those guys and they were saying that stuff I would say huh okay well you know I gotta go over here yeah I would rather talk to the four of you or the three of you than than, than anyone who's running for president um so they you deserve my attention a lot more I mean I was, I just noticed I'm wearing the same um shirt I was wearing last week uh for my 
cousin's barbershop. And I, I, I was thinking, I would, I would rather have my cousin, who the barber, as president of the United States than anyone who's currently running for president. And he, and he would do a better job. <laughs> like I, 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 and this is not a uh, William F. Buckley. I'd rather vote for you know the first five hundred names. Like, but I would, but I can name a hundred people who would make a better president. Uh, who I know personally than anyone who's running for president right now, I, I, except for maybe, sure. I, I don't know. I'm, I guess Asa Hus Hutchinson might be great. I don't know, but I, I don't know enough about Asa Hutchinson. Maybe Neither do I, but he's got a good background. Um, yeah. Yeah. So service. maybe, maybe we yeah. should, you know, uh, but, but honestly, like he was the only person on that debate stage who I thought he looks and sounds like someone who could be a president. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, there's a funny little aside, and not to put pressure on any of you, but as a funny little aside, he's the only person I've made a campaign contribution to this year, uh, and it was a dollar just to help yeah. him get on the stage. Right, but, right. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, if, well, if I've contributed... I my money where my mouth is. Yeah, if I, I've contributed to more than the four of you, then I'm just saying I get braggarts uh, yeah. uh, on that for that dollar. It's easy to one-up me if you like. You know, um, let's, all right, Bart, let's what let's else? I have one thing I want to set up for a future show because I also think that one of the most positive things that has happened in uh, political culture was the publication of that book, The Myth of Left and Right by the Lewis Brothers, because uh, the emperor has no clothes and th those two brothers are the ones who are pointing it out. And when serious people engage with this book, what you find is a lot of people are resistant because we're so invested in our political identities, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are going, huh, <laughs> maybe they're right, you know? And uh, so if we can get them on the, uh, a future show, I, which I think we will. Um, I will escalate that, uh, Professor. And just, for, just so you know, I did listen to um, a partial uh, video of one of theirs to try to get some familiarity before I reach out to them. So... I'm on the yeah. I'm on the path to getting but them lined up for our conversation. Even if they aren't on a future show, I just want to give that book a plug, um, even though it's pretty heavy with political theory. It's short, <laughs> so. Uh, um, but um, I really think that the publication of that book is one of the most positive, um, potentially potentially uh, uh, um, positive things in our political culture. Because if that dam breaks and people sort of realize. There's no essence to this. We're just, you know, voting team red, team blue. Just an identifying club that they're a part yeah. of. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that if you could get people to just sort of reorient themselves around something other than labels, because the labels create confirmation bias, and then mm -hmm. uh, you bring a lot of baggage in. Um, but anyway. Uh, What's the name of that book again, Professor? It's the myth of left and right by, um, but it's two brothers, uh, Hiram and Verlin Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. One's a political science professor and one's a history professor. And I know which one Professor Tudor likes more. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, the reason I like him has nothing to do with history. It's that we also both like Triumph motorcycles. Ah, fun. Yeah. So, <laughs> We, our friendship is mostly based on motorcycles, not, I mean, not history or politics or anything else. And, and, and so you actually know the Lewis brothers? I've met both of them. Okay. And I consider, I, I think I would say I, I consider Hiram to be a friend now. Verlin, okay. I, Verlin, I don't know that well. Um, I mean, I was at... Okay. I, I was at a, I didn't know you had known them. I just thought you had known of them. Well, so I didn't. It's, nice it's funny know. because I was at this thing with them for a few days it was one of those multi-days you know seminar type things and i didn't know who they were and i didn't put it together that i was already supposed to review this book um and then i was finally like oh my gosh you guys you're the one you're, you're the ones who wrote this book that i you know that anyway. oh you put a review on it who for uh the vital center the vital center okay yeah I'll look I, so i reviewed it for the vital center over the summer and that's on the interweb i assume 
Yeah, I'm sure you can find it if you just yeah, do cool. Well, well good. You got to tell me this stuff, Professor. Gosh, not I mean, only I you met them and you know them, but you, re you reviewed their book. God, okay. All, All right. right. Once we're off the air, I'll tell you another side story that's actually really interesting, but probably. Well, then let's hang up because I want to hear that and I get okay, I, I yeah, got to get going. Good. Um, yeah. So for folks that have tuned into the show, we try to do this uh, not every single Friday, but at least two, you know, two times a month. And we have been for the last couple of years. I think this is our 74th show or so I always make the number up, but it's something like that. And we are, we encourage you to join us um, in uh, being better citizens or at least trying harder. So thanks. I'm going to hang up. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah, stop the yeah, recording. I want to hear the inside. Yeah, I want to. Hear... All right. Hold on one sec. Thanks for joining, everyone. End meeting or stop recording? Hold on. I We don't have our uh, producer with us today. Stop recording. Uh, I'm going to cancel that. Where? I don't have to stop, stop the recording. Oh, here we go. No, I don't have a button anymore that says that. All right. Well, maybe uh, Tony will turn it off. Anyway, I, I um, so I, I was supposed to write that review. Wait, it's, it's, oh, stop recording. Hold on, hold on, hold on.